with us. We know that you love us and care for us. We accept the fact that we are undeserving, and yet for some reason you have elevated us to lofty positions in Christ. We're so grateful for him. We, he is our love. He is our transport to heaven. Help us as we study together to, to know a little more, that we might be a little bit more like Jesus. Forgive us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the, uh, the book of Revelation, the church at Ephesus is mentioned. As a matter of fact, if, if you're looking at, uh, at the screen, it, it's one of the seven churches of Asia. Uh, and when, when you're thinking, uh, thinking of, of Asia, you're looking, at, uh, you're, you're looking at what's called Asia Minor, unlike where China, for instance, is located today. But the seven churches that are mentioned in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation are found right there in that, in that same location. And it's interesting to me as, as you look at, uh, and I keep trying to flash the PowerPoint instead of up here. If you look, here, here's Ephesus. Uh, and then it's, it's interesting that I'm, I'm going to read a few verses in the book of Revelation. Uh, and, and John, years later, John was banned on the Isle of Patmos, which is right here, out in the Aegean Sea. That's where he was imprisoned. And uh, that's where he wrote, of course, uh, the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, and verse 1, it says, To the angel of the church at Ephesus, write this, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, Notice what he says about the church at Ephesus. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and they are not. And you have found them liars. We've been talking about that even in the book of 2 Corinthians, these false apostles. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Now, by this time, a few years later, he says, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. But at the time, you and I are reading uh, the book of Ephesians, starting in chapter 1, that the church at Ephesus is known for its love uh, for, for each other. It, it's, a, it's really a, a, a book that, really doesn't display any doctrinal problems per se. It, really, there are no problems. I think uh, as I look at the book, and I'll probably repeat this more than once, it, it, it appears to me that he's encouraging them to be faithful, to remain faithful. They live in a, a, a world that is full of idols. This is where Paul was in trouble later, and, and uh, uh, Diana uh, they had idols to, to Diana, and this is where the temple of Diana is found. And so it's the heart, uh, it's the heart, heart of pagan religion, and yet he has nothing, nothing to say about them in the book of Ephesians that's, that's bad. Whatever is said is good. And he, even here in the book of Revelation, uh, we see the word of the Lord that this was, this was a good church. Uh, what's important about the book of Ephesians? You might say, well, why was it written and what, how can it help us? The book of Ephesians is an important encouragement to a group of believers who are surrounded with paganism. I think we can learn from that because we live in a world that is uh, becoming more and more resistant, and that's maybe putting it a little softly, resistant to God, denying God even. And so living in a, in a world that is far from God and yet being faithful to God, let's just hope that we do as well as, as did the church at Ephesus. What's the main message? 
Well, the main message appears to me is that believers in Christ are reconciled. They're one. They're united. And not only to God, but to each other. And the, the greatest unifying factor was the faith. Faith in God. Faith in God through Jesus Christ. Uh, a, a precious faith, which he will talk about. A very precious faith that they had in common made them one. Isn't that true? Isn't that true today? No matter where you go, and no, no, culturally, no matter how much difference you have with those you find yourself surrounded with, and it may, really it comes to it makes no difference age level, uh, income level. What we have in common is greater than our differences when we have Christ in our hearts. And I find that true of, of the church at Ephesus. Uh, it's, uh, so it, it is a message that's good for all of us. And just starting, uh, starting uh, in, in the text, Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 and, and verse 3. I'm going to get out of this and get to... Before, before I start the, this, this verse, the, the introductory verses, first, the first two verses, uh, we can see in, in, there's six chapters. In the first three chapters, Paul reminds them of the, the wealth of, of a spiritual nature that they have in Christ. If you think about that, and I have, we, we can be so wrapped up existing, making a living. We're, we're, in, we're in bodies of flesh. And so it's, uh, it's really compelling for us to be focused on this world. And, and Paul wants them to take the time to stop and think and to realize that they have something very special. Very, very special in God through Jesus Christ. And we do too. And I, I don't know about you, but even, even as, as a Christian, even as a preacher, it, I have to be reminded by looking into the Word of God and, and by observing others that, that love the Lord and setting a great example. I have to be reminded of what's really important and constantly focus on how God has blessed us so. So very much in Christ Jesus. Uh, and that's what I see as I read this. In, in chapters 4 through 6, the, last, the first three, he tells them how wonderful they have it and all the blessings they have. And then as a result of having all these blessings in Christ, the last three chapters, he gives them some practical advice and he talks to them about okay, here's what you have and how special you are in Christ. And as a result of that, you have a, a, a responsibility now to, to use those blessings wisely and to follow the Lord. Practical, tell, telling them uh, how they live. So it, it's important. It, it was for them. Uh, and of course, uh, it is for us. As we look at at what's so very important to them, we, it, it's easy for us. It's easy for us, even though we know that Christ is special, that God is good, and that God is merciful. It's easy for us, as it appears to have been for them, it's, be, it's easy for us to let that slip each day. Instead of focusing Every single morning thinking about not only is it beautiful outside, but look what God gives us even on rainy days. How fortunate we are to be in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It, 
there, there was a day and time I never heard a, a, an old preacher, old enough, they're almost without exception gone now, when they would talk about the book of Ephesians and look at verse 3, that they would focus on we have, we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's all in Christ. Without Christ, there is nothing of eternal value that's going to, to stay with us, get us to eternity with God and keep us there. Every spiritual blessing is found in Christ. That's where it's at. And it, it's good to know that because there are so many religions in the world today and so many religious people that seem to focus on other saviors and a lot of times just on, on men, even if they're great men, instead of Christ. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Without Christ, we don't have anything worth, worth uh, holding to because it's only in Christ that these great and wonderful blessings abound. So our blessings are afforded to us because we have, we have looked to God in our sin, in our indifference. We have, our interest has been spiked and we have looked up. And as a result of that, and, it, and this is what I see as the great hope of mankind. Because a lot of times there, there will be no interest in God. But the gospel has a way of generating interest. That's why it's important for us to talk about the Lord. That's why it's, impossible, it's important for us to, to teach the word of God. To, to have banners and slogans and, and sermons and articles and, and conversations. Because, because the word of God itself carries within it a, a germ like a seed that will bring interest and therefore will end up bringing life where everything is dead. It just does. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is found in Christ. In Ephesians 1 uh, and, and verses 4 through 6, it says, Just as God chose us in Christ, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the, in the beloved. First of all, it, what does this say about, about God Accepting us. It, it, it's a little more than that, isn't it? Doesn't it say he chose us? He chose us. God chooses. He makes a choice. He's not forced to make a choice, but he chose. And, and when did he choose? When, when did he choose those uh, those that are, are going to be his. When did he make that choice? So before he ever created the earth, before he ever created the heavens and the earth, from all eternity, before the foundation of the world, uh, God made a choice. He made a choice. That it, it, It's his choice to make. But it's interesting to know that and it's worth thinking about that, that he was, we were not forced upon him. He chose us. That's remarkable when you think about our, our weakness. You think about our sinfulness. And you think about the fact that we, we do not become on our own apart from the Lord just because we believe and are baptized. We don't that we don't all of a sudden just have clean and pure thoughts and live righteous and holy and, and never need God again. That's not true. 
I think, I think we don't realize just how wicked mankind is. And God, God uh, accepts us. He chooses us. He forgives us. He expects things of us. But he wasn't picking out a rare gem when he picked me out. It's almost like he, he takes coal or dirt and he forms it into something. He chose. He chose. He didn't have to take us. Uh, he chose. And, and that choosing was, as has already been stated, uh, that before the foundation of the world. Uh, before the world. And there's something else I think we need to see here. When you think of, of not having any blame, of not having any blame anymore, what is that, what is that pointing to? What's that reference to? Who doesn't have blame? Yeah, that's, that's a little bigger answer. That's exactly right. The, it, aren't those without blame those who have been forgiven? The forgiven ones, Frank. I seem to remember that the word blameless almost literally means one who cannot have something held against them. If God has forgiven you, then he doesn't hold that against you. That's the way I see that. And, and what does it mean when it says that we, should, that we should be holy, not only blameless, but holy? What's that pointing to? What's that a reference to, that, that we're to be holy? We're not being that. We have a part to play in. Exactly. Yeah. We have a part. Not, not only are we forgiven, and I think when it talks about that we're, we're to be holy, he's not, he's not really primarily looking at the time we repent and are baptized. The believer repents and is baptized and is forgiven. That would be included. But he's talking about a life, that, that we live a life, that we strive to be holy. That's right. The world can't look at us and say, there's nothing good Yeah. We cause the best. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, it, it's, it, it's easy to focus on what God does for us in, uh, in forgiving us and then forgiving us again and again and again. And he does as we repent and turn to him. But we have a responsibility, Peter, as, as we look. Well, I'm thinking about Peter. Peter's the one known for saying, be holy as I am holy. <laughs> He's saying, God says, be holy. Uh, Paul's teaching that a life of servitude, of following the Lord is important. It's understood that we fail, but we need to get up. That's repentance. We need to get up and go again. We don't quit. We get up. We're holy. We live a holy life. He's, that, he's trying to, to encourage them to, to be holy, to live a holy life, not to give in to the pagan world around them, but, but to be holy. And if you slip, which you will, get up Fo and follow God. Yes.
Uh, to be holy. It, it's interesting that uh, uh, the Methodists, uh, at least they used to, uh, had a great amount of emphasis on, on the fact that uh, you're saved and, and then, and then at, at a later time as you serve the Lord, you're sanctified. Well, I don't, I don't agree with them the, the way they put it together, but the idea is really good. It, it's, a, it's a scriptural principle that we're, we're saved and at the time you're saved, uh, you're, you've got a mindset to do right. But you haven't learned how. You, you will probably immediately, I like the way he said that, you haven't learned how. You will probably just immediately do better, not, not always, but usually you're going to do better. But being holy is something that takes practice. You have to learn. Yeah, it, it comes from it comes from understanding the Word of God, from studying yourself, from being taught, and then you strive. And that's that's what Peter was emphasizing so much was be holy. Strive to follow God. Just because you fall, don't stay down. Just think of it. Just think of, of a child that's learning to walk. Uh, the child, uh, the, I mean, they, they may skin up their knees a little bit, wait just a little while, it's possible, uh, but they're going to get up and go again. Eventually, they're going to walk. That's what, that's what the, the, this is all about. That yeah, Chet? That's the learning, isn't it? That's that's the learning, and uh, not only not only is it learning, but it's it's growing, it's it's growing stronger because we uh, we never quit making mistakes. We don't, but we mature, and we do better. We grow in the Lord. We're holy. We become holy. Uh, a holy person isn't someone, if you say, well, you can't be holy unless you're someone that, that never sins. Well, then there won't be any holy people. It's just someone that has learned to trust in the Lord and do better. They get up when they fall. Get up. I, by get up, I always mean repent. They repent, they get up, they look to God, trust, and they moved on. Uh, so, uh, not only in, in Ephesians 1, verse, verse 5, it says, having God predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. Having predestined us before the foundation of the world, God made a determination uh, who, who would be his, and he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, oftentimes when you're studying, almost every time when, when you're studying this, it, it will come out, well, he, he, uh, uh, God has, God has uh, chosen and predetermined a class of people, the faithful. And that's true. That's true. But I, myself, I don't limit God to just knowing the class of people, the group of people, the faithful, but that God knows, he knows what choices I will make. God makes decisions based upon, uh, upon us, whether we accept his son and whether we, we live our lives in, not, not in perfection because none of us will make it, but in holiness in striving to serve God. Aiden? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you look at it like it, it, it that uh, uh, that he's looking, he's looking at us, and that uh, uh, if we're in this group, 
then it really doesn't matter what we do. That, that's pure Calvinism. It, that it doesn't make any difference what you do. Once you, once you chose, if he chose you, then, then he's going to save you. And, it does, and, and I'm not making that up. You look for yourself. That's exactly, that's, that is Calvinism. Choice. Yeah, it does. Tara. It, it is God working in us. There is no doubt about it. It's, it's his work. Uh, you know, you may, you may look at yourself and, and think, well, you know, I've, I've been a Christian for a few years now, and I'm, I'm really doing great. Just look at me. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm better than most people now. That's God works whenever, whenever we, we do well. It's because... It's because we followed the Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit. We're, we're letting God guide and, and direct us. And, and again, I know we fall. I know from time to time we quit listening to God and, and we start listening to the devil. We listen to ourselves, which ultimately is being governed by the devil. But we must remember that as we do good, God has chosen us in him. And God has chosen to accept those who, who accept him and walk in him, are holy because of him. Not perfect individuals. You know, the, we, there is a sense in which we become holy, righteous, and perfect, and that's, that's in Christ. As we strive to serve him. Right. Romans 8, verse 29. For, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, there's that word again, to become conformed to the image of his son. As we strive to make ourselves like his son, that's what he's asking of us. Now, we realize that we can't become. Yeah, I like that. And I like the way you say that because that's, that's the way it is. We, I think we have a hesitancy to, to compare ourselves to Jesus in any way. And yet that's exactly what we're supposed to do as, as we strive every day to be like him. I, I think it, in, as I look back through the years, this becomes, this becomes uh, more obvious when when you, sometimes people are so good that they don't have to make a lot of outward visible changes when they come to the Lord. So it's not as, it's not as obvious, even though they're, they're just as precious as anybody and, and just as holy. But it's, it sometimes is very obvious when someone was, according to anybody that knew him, was a no good. But they come to the Lord, and they walk with the Lord. And if you know them well, and someone says, well, do they never sin? You'd say, well, yeah, they sin. They're, they're, they're not perfect. But you'd say, you should see them in the beginning. You, you should see the difference in them as a result of walking with the Lord. Yes, a Yes. Oh, and yeah. Sadly, too many times our brothers and sisters also fall into that same trap, especially the situation when the man has sinned. How many times, seven times, six? Oh, there he is again. They look for us to do that. And we're going to do it. We're going to fall. Like you said, what sets us apart is when we fall, whether it be the first time or the hundred first time, when we do that. 
Yes. And if we just fall and melt away, we're not set apart. But if we fall and get up, like you said, we can be examples of righteousness and holiness. A couple of individuals, one, one of them had been an alcoholic for years and had, had spent quite a bit of time in jail, was just, you know, kind of a menace to society. He obeyed the gospel and his life changed. Uh, he, became, he became a different person. Now, there was something happened, and I know what it was, in, in, in his life. 12, 13 years later, and he relapsed to what he had known, and he got back in the bottle again. But when he came, it, it took a little while. But when he came to his senses, uh, came back to God. And since you're not God and I'm not God, we really never truly know the hearts of people like God does. But in my, in my opinion, there's not a better person living, godly person living than this man. I know a man who committed adultery. Really, I know two or three after years of faithful service. One of them in particular comes to my mind. And I, I remember when he confessed this, he'd already confessed it to his wife, but he confessed it to others, and I, I was one of them that he confessed it to. And I, I can remember how deeply sad he was and once again today I don't think there's a better person a more godly person living I really don't we, for, we, we do slip up and fall we need to be forgiven but you can sure tell when someone is striving to be with the Lord Sometimes they have a lot of, of kind of minor collisions, crashes and falls. At other times, they'll have a major or two or three crashes. But the thing is, get back up and look to the Lord. Quit looking to yourself. Look to the Lord. That's where forgiveness was in, in the beginning when you started, and that's where you're going to find it now. Uh, in the Lord, uh, uh, those are that's just that's just the way it is. Uh, I don't have a hard time. I don't have a hard time forgiving sinners because I'm one of them, and I don't have a hard time accepting and forgiving men and women who have made what we might call big mistakes because that's exactly what God does is forgive little mistakes, big mistakes. Uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 7, In Jesus we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made, known, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to the good pleasure of, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to his counsel, according to his will that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And if that doesn't give you hope, and which is what God meant for it to do with the brethren at Ephesus, 
And that doesn't make you feel a little more secure in your relationship to God, then I don't know what would. We have redemption. God has purchased us with the blood of Christ. And he did that according to the riches of his grace. He chose to save us. He extended mercy. He extended compassion to us. And then he revealed his will. That's what the mystery is. Having made known the mystery of his will. Mystery is something that was hidden. And yet now it is revealed. Paul says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. God's plan, that's the mystery, is to save us, wicked, sinful people, to save us in Christ, Frank. That's really what he says even here, isn't it? Verse 10. I think that that's the specific reference that he's making here. Because that was a problem that they were having in the first century. Jews and Gentiles were not in the same You know, God, God's plan itself was a mystery, and then God's plan involved bringing both Jew and Gentile together, which itself was an amazing feat. That's all done, that's all done in Christ. And, and the word adoption, uh, by the way, the, the Ro- Roman adoption is, is interesting, is, is that when you were adopted, you, you gave up any connection you had with the former family. Any inheritance you might have, any debt that you had incurred. Yes, Renee. I've been with Christ and, you know, I'm thinking another example of that is in verse 7, where that section where he read, um, he talks about we and us. I think that's referring to Jews. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Jew and Gentile being brought together. Uh, and that was always a problem in the first century. Uh, it, uh, you talk about racial divide. Uh, Christ always has been the answer to that. Always has been. Uh, when you're adopted, then you, you have, you just become a son. Or a daughter. You just become, I mean, it, it, there is no difference legally. There's no difference in your standing in the family. None at all than with someone who was uh, born in the family. You're adopted in. All the same, all, everything is the same in every way. So no, no connection with the past life. 
You have no claims on what you might have received back there because now you have a new life, a new life in this family. Uh, I, to me, that's an encouraging thought. God has chosen not just to accept us and forgive us, but we are adopted into the family of God. He has adopted us. Wow. To me, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's very, very powerful. And my time is, uh, my time is up. Any last, anybody have a, a final a closing comment you would, or question you'd like to make? Yes. We have that obligation that Aiden was talking about, being holy. And there, it's impossible for you to know the mind of God unless, unless you have a knowledge of his word. You want to know what's on God's mind? Well, there's a whole lot on his mind that, that you and I will not know this side of eternity and maybe not then. There's a lot we won't know. But whatever there is to know, we find it in his word. Whatever he wants you and I to know, that is revealed. You want the mind of God? Look in the word of God. And that's, that's where you find it. Amen. <laughs> all right, our time is up. Thank you all very much.